Greetings family, uh, another beautiful Sunday morning. I greet you in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Beloved, I want you to buckle up because this morning we're going to take you on a ride that could be bumpy, but it could be eye-opening, it could reshape your mind and your entire life. So join me this morning. My, my intention is to completely severe, sever the relationship between anyone and fake Jesus. The devil is posing as Jesus. His gift is to be a sly deceiver. That's his specialty. And he is posing as the real Jesus. And many, many people are following fake Jesus and sincerely in their hearts believing that that's the real Jesus. So my job in these last few weeks and today is to cut the tie, uh, break the frequency that is binding you with that false frequency of fake Jesus. It is causing untold havoc in your life, in the Christian's life. And many of you ask Jesus, the God that you think you are calling to, you ask Jesus, why am I going through all of this? Is this your plan? And Jesus certainly promised us it's not his plan. His plan is to give us untold joy, overwhelming joy. John 10.10, 10, remember, I've come to give you abundant life. So the real Jesus came to give you abundant life, but the fake Jesus is posing as the real Jesus, and he is slowly eating away and destroying your life. So if you are living and breathing for the Lord Jesus Christ, but you're not getting satisfaction. In other words, you're not getting the results you expect as a believer. There's a strong chance that you are living a lie, truly and sincerely believing that you are serving the Lord. And some of you go with all your heart, and God loves you. And that's one of the reasons why. At the end of this, if you find that you've been either leading people to fake Jesus or you've been following a fake Jesus. There is no shame. There is no shame in saying, let me redirect, let me recommit my path. Let me really find who Jesus truly is. There, there's no shame in admitting a mistake. Every one of us have done mishaps, uh, uh, practiced mishaps throughout our lives. So, so when I speak to you and something clicks inside of you, instead of fighting it, understand that God wants you back. Your name has been written. And that's why he's standing at the door and he's knocking at your door because your name has been written. He's standing there with a page in his hand. If you can imagine that. And your name is on the book of life. And that's why he's standing and knocking. So consider this morning's message a knocking at your door. Simply because the real Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, He has your name already written and He does not want to lose you. So I'm going to share with you a few things when you realize all these things and you want to recommit. I'm going to invite you to say a prayer to the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at the book of Matthew 7. 22 and 23. We read the scripture last week, but I'm going to redo some stuff so that we get the proper picture. I need to solidify this in your spirit so that you never ever get misled ever again. Matthew chapter 7 verse 22 and 23. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, 
Have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name? Done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You who practice lawlessness. My goodness. That tells me that there is a fake Jesus. And they are good and sincere, lovely people that are sincerely following fake Jesus. This scripture tells me there is a perp there is a person people are following. There is a Jesus people are following. And they, when they go to heaven one day, if it has to be this fake Jesus that they're following, they're going to get a shock when in Jesus, the true Jesus tells them, I never knew you. Who are you? Because your name is not here. It's been blotted out. How shocked will you be? There are many will be stunned. Many, thousands, millions will be stunned because the devil, the great deceiver, has managed to convince them that there's only one Jesus and all of us are worshipping that one Jesus. But one day, according to the scripture and Jesus' own words, He's going to say, depart, I don't know who you are. And you and I know there are many millions of people praying in the name of Jesus, casting out demons in the name of Jesus, prophesying in the name of Jesus. But which Jesus? I'm going to draw a picture for you in the coming minutes and I want you to identify. It's going to be easy for you to identify fake Jesus. Just from the signs that we know about them. Now I'm going to take you to a book that is also part of the, uh, uh, the Apocrypha, the hidden texts that are not included in the current version of our Bibles. One of those books is the Gospel according to Mary Magdalene. Now they found this book and taken it to the State Museum in Germany in the late 1800s. And it sits there and some people have decoded the original text and into English so that we can understand. But at the same time, some pages of the manuscript that they found are missing. Uh, but what we have remaining, I want to take the time to read to you. This is the account of Mary Magdalene. And we'll start from chapter 4, reading verse 25. This is when Jesus appeared to the disciples all together. And Peter said to him, since you have explained everything to us, tell us this also. What is the sin of the world? The Savior said, there is no sin. But it is you when you make sin, when you do the things that are like the nature of adultery, which is called sin. One moment, I'll stop there if you don't mind. You remember I spoke to you last week that your DNA gets poisoned and the listening of a poisoned message can contaminate your DNA, which causes you to sin. Otherwise, there is no sin. But the moment you act on a message that is contaminated by Satan, sin is born in you. But they, God said He didn't create you with that. Until you make choices. Until... The sinful nature in you, because it lives there and you haven't washed it clean, it causes you to make decisions uh, that are poor. When you have a choice to make, do I stay faithful to my wife 
am I going to be faithful to my husband at that moment when temptation comes because evil has embedded himself in your DNA, you act on that. And God says, Jesus' word says, that is what sin is. It doesn't have to be adultery. It can be many other things of the heart. Let's look at verse 27. That is why God came into your midst to the essence of every nature in order to restore it to its roots. In other words, Jesus is saying, that's the reason why I came, so that I can wash your DNA. I can make you born again, so that you can be reestablished to your root. And once you're born again, once you washed in the blood of Jesus, that's the time your DNA becomes how it was supposed to be. But along the way, once we're born again, the devil wants to introduce to us fake Jesus. And then when we listen to the words of the false prophets and teachers of fake Jesus, when we hear those words, once again our spirit gets poisoned. There are many scriptures in the New Testament that can tell us this, but for now I'll continue reading here. Verse 28, Then he continued and said, That is why you become sick and die, for you are deprived of the one who can heal you. That's powerful. Jesus is saying this is the reason why. Because you listen to poison words, because you're following fake Jesus, because you still got contaminated DNA, that you haven't been washed clean, or you were washed clean when you once got saved, but because you were misled by fake Jesus, you got poisoned again, and this is the reason why you continuously get sick. This is the reason why you're suffering. You're going through problems. You can't explain it. Verse 29, He who has a mind to understand, let him understand. Matter gave birth to a passion that has no equal, which proceeded from something contrary to nature. Then there arises a disturbance in its whole body. Beloved, I don't want to take too much time on this, but I want to point out to you, Jesus is saying because of this inflammation of the DNA by evil, words that you hear, um, practices that you perform because of the false message of the fake Jesus, you get contaminated and your whole body gets contaminated. Jesus is expressly telling us that there's a disturbance in the whole body. Verse 34, I'm going to skip a little bit. Beware, no one lead you astray, saying, Lo here or lo there, for the Son of Man is within you. Wow. Jesus, once again, even through Mary Magdalene's testimony, says, Jesus is in you. He's saying, I'm inside you. You know, some people don't treat their bodies as holy because they know the things they think and the things they do. They disrespect who they are. They believe that they cannot be holy even though they want to believe that the Spirit of God is inside. They can't accept that they're holy. They, they think the Bible is holier than them. Yet the Spirit of God is in you and you are the temple but you treat the Bible war with more respect than yourself. And one of the reasons is because you understand how you think. You think that God's grace depends on your goodness. And because you're not good, because you haven't been good in your thoughts and your actions, you believe you're not worthy to be called holy, and therefore something like the Bible is holier than you. Listen to me. You don't deserve to be holy. But God, by His grace, made you holy. So you have to, don't let the devil lie to you. This is the temple because the Spirit of God indwells you. It is the highest temple in the earth, on the earth, on this planet. If the Spirit lives in you, He's not going to live in things that man made, handmade things. He's going to live in the temple that is you. And you are His temple not because you are good, but because of His grace. 
So you're not deserving. Don't think I don't deserve, that's why I can't treat myself well. No! It's because God loves you and His grace is upon you. That's why He put His Spirit in there. But make sure His Spirit doesn't depart from you. Make sure you continuously know the real Jesus from the fake. My children, God says, know my voice. So I'm going to share with you. Uh, anyway, let's carry on reading. Verse 35. Follow after him, Jesus says. Those who seek him will find him. Go then and preach the gospel of the kingdom. That's instructions. Verse 38 takes us to a whole new level. Jesus' words. He says, do not lay down any rules beyond what I appointed you. And do not give a law like the lawgiver, lest you be constrained by it. You know, I taught you over the past few weeks that once you have a law, you have to follow that law and that law constrains you. It restricts you. It puts you in a box where you can't use discretion. You have to simply follow the law. And Jesus is saying, do not lay down any rules. This is he were his words to his disciples. That's why they walked around and preached with nothing in their hands. They had no assistance to minister, to pray, to, to do anything. That's because the Spirit of God was in them. And Jesus says, let's make no rules. Let the Spirit of God inside guide you. And this is very powerful. Uh, when he said this, he departed. Verse 39, chapter 5. Verse 2, then Mary stood up. Well, before that, they all got grieved and they were worried and they were troubled. Their hearts were worried. Now Jesus is gone. What are we going to do? And Mary encouraged them in verse 2. She says, then Mary stood up, greeted them all and said to her brethren, do not weep and do not grieve, nor be irresolute for his grace will be entirely with you and will protect you. She was an encouragement. Verse 5. Peter said to Mary, Sister, we know that the Savior loved you more than the rest of the women. Tell us the words of the Savior which you remember, which you know, but we do not. Nor have we heard them. This tells us that Jesus spoke special words to Mary in private. Because she was one of his favorite people disciples and Peter is saying sister can you please share with us what Jesus told you in private things that we don't know verse 10 I said to him Lord how does he who sees the vision see it through the soul or through the spirit well when she had a vision she wanted to know from Jesus Verse 11, the Savior answered and said, He does not see through the soul, nor through the spirit, but the mind that is between the two, that is what sees the vision. And it is, and, and the sentence cannot be identified because this, the text is not clear and the paper has been torn. But Jesus, I'm just sharing this with you so that you get a little insight into how Jesus was communicating and he, he continues in chapter 8. I'm not going to read to you all of that. Those are very interesting and powerful stuff. Maybe one day I'll get a chance. Chapter 9, it ends. When Mary had said this, she fell silent. Verse 1. Since it was to this point that the Savior had spoken to her. She kept quiet. Verse 2. But Andrew, that Simon Peter's brother, answered and said to the brethren, Say what you wish to say about what she has just told us. I at least do not believe that the Savior said this, for certainly these teachings are strange ideas. Now the whole of chapter 8, I didn't read to you, but it's nothing strange, it's just difficult to comprehend uh, and understand. But if you have the Spirit of God in you, it's not very difficult. But... When Mary came and told them this whole thing, whole episode about her conversation with Jesus, Andrew, he stood up 
Peter's brother and he says, listen, I don't know about you guys, but I don't believe what she's saying because what she's saying sounds weird. Uh, verse 3, Peter answered and spoke concerning the same things. In other words, Peter got up and he said, exactly, Andrew, I, I know what you're saying and I trust that we are both are right. I, I don't believe this Mary Magdalene. And uh, verse 4, uh, he questioned them about the Savior. Did he really speak privately with a woman and not openly to us? This is Peter speaking. Are we to turn about and all listen to her? Did he prefer her to us? So Peter got very upset. Then Mary wept and said to Peter, My dear brother Peter, what do you think? Do you think that I have thought up myself in my heart? all this or that I am lying about the Savior then Levi answered and said to Peter Peter you have always been hot tempered now I see you contending against the woman like advers like the adversaries but if the Savior made her worthy who are you indeed to reject her surely the Savior knows her very well that is why he loved her more than us. Rather let us be ashamed and put on the perfect man and separate as he commanded us and preach the gospel, not laying down any other rule or other law beyond what the Savior said himself. There's another very powerful opportunity for you to understand. There is no law. There's a holy book for guidance, for understanding, for learning. But it's not God. God, Jesus himself said right here, is inside. Don't look there. Don't look there. Don't run there. He's here. Be careful. Fake Jesus might make you move around. And when they heard this, they began to go forth to pro proclaim and to preach. Let me give you an understanding. Peter, there is another book of the Apocrypha called the Apostle, the, the Apostles, the story of or the Acts of the of the Apostles. And two specific apostles are in that book mentioned and their history. It was Peter and Paul. Paul was a preacher known unto the Gentiles and Peter was to the Jews. But they both were Jewish. And one of the things that the traits of a Jewish person, um, especially these men, they had a culture. They had a culture of subjugating women. Women were inferior to men. And it was demonstrated when Peter said, Mary... Jesus spoke to you, why don't you tell us what he said? And then, when she started to speak, he says, because this is so profound, you can't, can't be Jesus gave you all that stuff. Because he felt that man was superior to woman. So you need to understand context. Um, these two, these two uh, people, Paul and Peter, were buddies. When they went to Rome, they helped each other against Simon the sorcerer. They were... Uh, listed as, as, as um, uh, or the recorded as you know, being put to death during the same time by Emperor Nero. They comforted each other during those times. And they shared the same sentiment about women. Uh, in fact, l let me show you this. Because Paul writes this. Paul writes this. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 to 12. In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Let a woman learn in silence. With submission. And I do not 
permit a woman to teach. Here's a law. Here's a law that Peter is laying down in his letter to a church in Ephesus, to the pastor that's there, Timothy, and he's telling Timothy, I do not let women teach. <laughs> that's powerful. Or to have authority over a man, but to be silent. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 34 and 35. Paul says this. Let your women keep silent in the churches. For they are not permitted to speak. But they are to be submissive. As the law also says. There's a law again. And if they want to learn something. Let them ask their husbands at home. For it is shameful for women to speak in church. That is an amazing revelation. Some people read the scripture and ignore it like it's not there. They, let me first reiterate to you. There is nothing wrong with a woman talking in church, being equal, because no man is a favorite. Everyone is the same in his eyes. But the law that was written before Jesus came, subjugates women, makes women second-class citizens. And this is the thing that Jesus wanted to break. And that's why he said, don't listen to the laws anymore. You have to, uh, uh, you have to ignore those laws because I give you grace and all women and all men and everybody is equal. Because I love you all. But Paul is saying they must be quiet in church. They must keep quiet. And I'm going to use our colloquial language. They must shut up. When they go home, if they have a question, they must ask their husbands over there. What does that tell you about the contents of what's written here? And the same woman, listen to me carefully, who preach to you, who teach you, who stand next to their husbands and share the gospel, they lift up the same book in which these words are written and they say, this is the law of God. This is God. This is the word of God. This you must swallow it. Meditate on it. When you're doing something, you must check on it. That's your primary source. There is no other source. You remember Luther, Luther told us, there's no other source of divine knowledge. Just this Bible and so if that's the case, the same Bible that you say is God and, and, and must, must be followed to the letter, you must study it, meditate on it, go to Bible college, learn about it. And, and at the same time, it says you must keep quiet, but you're still talking. There is a contradiction. You, you, you're a person that speaks with one mouth and believes with something else double-minded so let me tell you this you either believe that this is the word of God and it's 100% correct and you have to follow it or you believe discretion is the order so you have to understand how the Bible was written by who it was impacted now let me tell you something about Paul Paul was a person who um, 90% or 70% of the New Testament rather was written was the letters that he wrote, the Catholics took it and they put it into the Bible and they passed it around as law. And they said all Christians must follow this because this is the thing that, that they must follow. And one of the things that Peter, Paul says, another passage in Ephesians, same Ephesus church where Timothy was, he was saying, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 5, bond servants, which is slaves. Be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ. Then he spoke also another letter to Colossians. And chapter 3 verse 22. Bond servants, once again, slaves. Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleases, but in sincerity of the heart, fearing God. You know what he's saying? In these two letters, he's saying the slaves that have been shackled, that work for rich Roman people and rich people 
in the Roman society because Rome had all the riches. And all the servants that worked for them were slaves. They were not paid. They were just given food, clothing and shelter. And they were kept in bondage, most of them. And if they became Christians, Paul was encouraging them to be obedient to their master. Even though they had no dignity, but be obedient. On the surface, it might not look bad, but if you study the history, Paul was trying to win favor with the Roman authorities. That's why he was including that, so they allowed him to spread the gospel. So he was trying to balance one act with the other. And so, in other words, in other words, in order for you to put a teaching in place, to put a doctor in front of your name, you need to understand context. Context is very important. Without context, you lose everything. You, you can't, you know, I have, when I was two years old, my family gave me a two-year-old birthday party. The article was put in the Ladysmith Gazette. Well, there was hardly any news, so that was a big news. And in the caption of that article was, uh, they spelled my name wrong too, but uh, celebrating a gay birthday party. That was 1971. Gay birthday party. Now, in 1971, gay meant happy. Very happy. Joyful. If that article has to go in now in 2020 and you say gay birthday party, people imagine half-naked men walking around with dresses or something of that sort. Because it, the meaning is changed. Therefore, you can't cut a story out of the Old Testament or the New Testament, which was 2,000 years ago and longer, and you cut that article and you paste it in today's world. You can't take that story and apply it to today's world because it's a different context. So if you're going to put a doctor in front of your name, make sure you know. You have to study. You have to study. You have to know. You have to have knowledge. You have to have understanding. Knowledge gives you power, power to understand. And that's what gives you wisdom to make choices and decisions. So you can't run around blindly putting doctor in front of your name. It's good to preach. You don't need all that to preach the gospel. The good news, everybody can preach. Because it's simple. Jesus came, he died for you, he rose again, he lives, and he's here to wash you. Accept him as your savior and you will be saved. That message is simple. But if you're going to teach, make sure you have your ducks in a row. And that's why it's important when you teach the word. And I don't mean the Bible. When you teach Jesus, the word is wisdom, logos. When you teach Jesus, you must teach from a deep point of understanding. You have to be qualified to study. That's what Paul even says. You have to know what you're saying. If you're leading someone, it's like, if you don't know, it's like the blind leading the blind. And that's why everybody falls in the ditch. No, you have to have wisdom. You know, before I took up this job that my father looks after me for, I have to be the best at what I do. And that's why, you, you know, when you study archaeology, you learn the history, you, you study the, 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 the crockery they used. You'd carbon date it to know when you dig the earth, you find there's layers. You know, many years ago in 1999, 2000, I studied and I saw, you know, when you dig down, every civilization has different layers and colors of sand. And there was one layer that was dark. And it was burnt. It's like the city got burnt. And it was at the bottom of the Dead Sea where Sodom was. And there's ashes on that level. And the stuff that's been burnt there, when they dated it, carbon dated it, they found out it was the exact time Sodom and Gomorrah were burnt. So you know that the biblical story has validation that there's something like that happened. And when you study the crockery, you know what kind of culture they had. You know what kind of uh, uh, race that was. You have to have that kind of knowledge. For example, if you find people wearing uh, spiritual garb, sometimes you find people that lived in the Middle East that walk in the desert. You'll find that because it's desert, sandstorms come. 
And so what they do is they cover their mouth and they cover their head so sand don't get stuck in their hair or go into their mouth or nostrils. And they cover the whole half face and they cover the head and they wear longs and they put pants underneath and they walk. Today, you find people dressing just like that in, in town, in Durban City, in Cape Town City, in New York City. They're just walking. There's no sand, but they're wearing that because they think it's part of a religious culture when it was a custom made for a certain time. You find pastors washing the feet of the, the congregation members because Jesus did it. No, he did it because those days there was no tar. People used to walk with sandals, dust. When they come into someone's house to eat, they can't come with dusty feet, so they wash it outside so that their feet is clean because when they sit, they sit down on the floor and their feet touches somebody else's uh, knee or whatever, so it needs to be clean. So that's the reason. So it was, a, it was not a ritual it was a culture. So you learn all these things so that when you're understanding the Bible, when you're understanding literature, you don't do it uh, you know, with no marker. You understand what you're reading. And therefore, cutting and pasting is dangerous. Because some people will take a biblical example and say, that's what God is going to do right now. And in Jesus' name, if he did it, then he'll do it again. No, it's, it's a bit different. You have to have a little bit smarts. Anyway, once you create laws, once you set laws in place, it creates religion. Religion is a set of beliefs or a set of laws called doctrine established by a group of people or people that's supposed to lead a person to God. That's an amazing truth. And you find that most people, because they have a book to lead them, that's a set of laws they don't create a spiritual relationship with God. They create a religion. And religion leads to false Jesus. And I'm going to teach you even more. I'm going to go a little bit deeper, if you don't mind. Now listen very carefully. Fake Jesus or fake God. And we know there's a fake God. He promotes... The Bible as the word of God. He promotes drunkenness, falling down, rolling, laughing, the yoga spirit. He promotes signs and wonders. Those three things are very important to identify fake Jesus. As soon as you hear somebody saying, follow the word, study the word, read the word, meditate on the word, by heart the word, all these things, this is the word, this is God. The moment you hear somebody saying that, you remember what Paul put in there. You either believe that and follow that, or you admit it cannot be God, it can be Holy Scriptures, it can be breathed into servants to write. Servants are fallible, but it certainly cannot be. So soon as you hear somebody trying to do that, I want you to do this for me. Remember what I'm saying. Soon as you see somebody do that, first thing must come out of your mouth, fake God, fake Jesus. You can choose which one you want to say, but if you identify it, it cannot put its tentacles in you. It cannot join your life with its frequency. So remember that. As soon as you see drunkenness falling down, blowing people and they're collapsing and busting their heads and rolling around, fake God, fake Jesus. As soon as you see people mentioning signs and wonders, that's going to take over the world in the last days. Be careful. Soon as you see these three things. There's many others, but I just want to highlight these three things for now, for our purposes. Fake Jesus, when you have fake Jesus, you have no peace, no joy, only depression, pain, heartache, suicide, possession, prolonged agony for years and years. And some of the well-meaning ministers who learn from other people, 
There's nothing wrong in saying, hey, let me just uh, listen to what pastor is saying and readjust. Instead of going the wrong direction, maybe you did it sincerely, you didn't know. But now that God is knocking on your door, maybe you can open it and reorganize your leading. And you find that when, when people go through this prolonged agony, heartache, only problems, only issues, you find that they love God, they're sincere. I, I, I know lots of people love my Jesus. Uh, but it's just heartache and problems about problems and you wonder what is going on. That's a sign that fake Jesus is there. That somewhere along the line, fake Jesus got his hooks in you. That you are following the teaching of somebody who is teaching you fake Jesus. Be careful, there's a lot in town. Listen, when you need change, you can't make change through prayer. Lots of people contact me, Pastor, I'm going through this, can you please pray for me? Prayer is not going to help you. You first have to unclean all that poison that you've put inside of you. To do that, you have to hear the right words. Words are very important to me. Words are powerful that you need to understand it. Mark chapter 4 verse 24. And Jesus is talking there and he's saying, Then he said to them, Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use it, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. So hearing by Jesus, by the wisdom of Jesus, hearing by the word, and that word means wisdom. By hearing the wisdom of Jesus, your life changes. And that's, that's very powerful. Because if you don't do that, Matthew 59 says, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. In other words, he's saying you're worshipping and worshipping and praising and praying. It's all for nothing. He says it's in vain because you're praying to fake Jesus. You're counting on fake Jesus. Jesus says, my hands are tied. I can't do anything for you if you're praying to fake Jesus. Mary 4.24, what we read earlier. You get, Jesus was speaking. He said, you can get sick and die. And, and you're wondering why you're getting sick and you're dying. Because fake Jesus is at work. So, so let me read to you now. I want to... I want to lift up a mirror because ignorance, I want to show you how ignorance works. Uh, Romans 8, 5 to 10, we read that last week and the week before, but it's so important that I want to read that to you again. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the flesh, on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, the carnal mind is enmity, is an enemy of God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God, and if Christ lives in you, the body is dead. Remember, the body is dead. The body is totally dead. If your spirit is alive, it means the body is dead. This is Jesus' uh, thinking as the scripture is written. But I want to tell you what ignorance does. Let me show you how ignorance works. Fake Jesus wants to resurrect the carnal nature, the flesh, your physical desire. It, it, fake Jesus wants to resurrect it. And the real Jesus wants to press it down. In other words, he doesn't want you to care about your life. But the fake Jesus wants you to care a lot about your life. Here's your big sign for you. Let me show you the teaching, the fake Jesus, what, what it has taught you over the years. It has taught you to fast for something. If a pastor, if your leader, if your false prophet, whoever you've been following has told you to fast for your job, fast for your car, Fast for your healing. They are teaching you to resurrect the desire of life, of your life. 
to love your life so much that you can put a fast in so that your life can be blessed. Fake Jesus wants you to resurrect the flesh desire. Let me do a fast. You fast to suppress your spirit man. And that's what fake Jesus does. Fake Jesus makes you fast to resurrect the flesh and suppress the soul. While the real Jesus wants you to press the flesh down. In other words, don't care about your life. Because Jesus said if you care about your life, you will lose it. The real Jesus wants you to press your flesh down and resurrect your soul. Give it more power. That's what Jesus, the real Jesus wants. The people who sell fake Jesus, they want to tempt you to do a fast so that something works out for you on this earth. Never for the strengthening of your soul. Be careful, open your ears and hear what the Spirit of God is saying. The real Jesus wants you to crucify your flesh. The fake Jesus wants you to satisfy your flesh. Let's look at minor things, some other things in, in the mirror. Lots of people, if it doesn't benefit them and their life on earth, they probably won't do it. Let's look at, let's look at giving tithe. Now common sense tells you that people like me who preach, and there's many others who preach the true gospel of God, cannot get the work done unless we are sustained. That, if you are belonging to God, God will put that decision or that prompting in your heart. I can't force you to do that. Neither will I, will I you know, like, convince you. No, that's something that must come from you. If it doesn't come from you, I might as well not get it. But many people only pay their tithes because it benefits them. Because they've been taught that it protects them. Other than that, they won't contribute to the kingdom. They won't make one to worry whether it, because it doesn't benefit them. The only way it benefits them is for protection, so that's why they pay. They pay out of fear, because they don't want anything to go wrong in their life. They don't want to get sick, they don't want to lose their job or whatever, so out of fear, they pay their tithe. Seed offering. There again, the fake Jesus tempts you to give a seed offering because you must want something on this earth back. So the seed offering is a temptation offering. But if you're not going to get anything back from the seed, then you, then you won't give a seed. It's always because you want something. Even if you do something, if you come to sing, you must sing and get honored by people. That's why you'll do it. If you come to church, it's because you want to show off your new dress. Or you want to come to fellowship with people. That's why you come. Or you're coming to see your girlfriend. If it doesn't benefit you, lots of people don't serve the kingdom. Examine why you pay. Why you come. Is it because you love him or is it because of some other reason? That will benefit you. Now fake Jesus promotes this. It must benefit you. Then it makes, your, it makes it worth it. Even let me just give you something that we're trying to do. I'm trying to take this message. And I'm trying to broadcast it to many, many people who are following fake Jesus. It's a thing of the soul because one day these souls are going to be lost. And it's just because I couldn't reach them. Maybe God will find another way. But I'm, I'm trying to use you to go on your Facebook, take a little bit of your time, and share this message with your friends, with everybody, wherever you can. We don't know where your share 
will take it too. Even some of you have taken extra time to look for friends and WhatsApp them separately, message them separately, because even though it doesn't benefit you, how is it going to benefit you? It benefits the kingdom. That's why some of you do it. That's what motivates you because, Lord, I won't only do things because it benefits me, but I'll do it because it benefits your kingdom. Some people won't. Will they listen? It's just for themselves. They'll absorb it. They'll like it. They'll eat it. They'll sleep it. It must only benefit their life. If it benefit my life, that's all that matters. And that's what I'm trying not to let you do. So examine your motives to, to know whether you, are, whether you are led by a fake Jesus or whether you are really following true Jesus. Because true Jesus wants you not to care about your life. Let's look at the prayer of Jesus. When the disciples said, Lord, tell us how to pray. Some denominations take that prayer literally. And they say the same prayer, and I can't understand how they can have the same meaning. Jesus was merely giving us an example, a prototype of how the prayer should be rounded up to God. And he says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Nowhere in that prayer is take care of my rent month in. Make sure I have things to eat tomorrow. He just said, take care of today. Give us this, this day, our day. Not tomorrow, today. Nothing physical. Nothing permanent. He never taught you to pray for anything. Because his job was to crucify your flesh. And let me tell you a secret. My life has been an example. I went through lot of problems and trials, but I came out of it. And not once did I look up to God and I say, God bless me. Never. Because I wanted only my spirit. I said, Lord, all I want is wisdom. That is all I want. I, I took from Solomon and I said, if I have that, I have everything. And because wisdom is Jesus, if I have Jesus, I have everything. And that, you know, I didn't pray for a, for a house. I didn't pray for a car. I didn't pray for anything. I got it because I'm just, I just love Jesus. Listen to me, there's a lot of fake in the world. But I don't want the biggest fake to get to you. You know, if you look at the world today, you know, I was talking with Sister Nash the other day, and you watch these cooking channels they have, and this people go around tasting other people's food. And every time someone cooks or they taste, every expression is not is the same. Mmm, so wonderful, so beautiful this taste. Mmm, the light tangy flavor of this and that. And we know we've been around. Most of the food out there is terrible. But because they have to pretend, because they're promoting something, they call they do fake things. And the devil's kingdom is the same. There's a lot of fake. And I want you to make sure you identify. So soon as somebody tells you, let's get together and pray for this. Let's get together and fast for that. Let's believe this is the word of God. Let's have a session. You can't go to Bible college and come out and be qualified to teach. You can share the gospel. You can preach good news. But if you want to lead the flock, put an extra effort in so that when the fake Jesus comes, you protect your congregation from them. And the congregation has to be wide-eyed to know when they are being misled. So, beloved, I want to severe all time. Every single tie that you have had with darkness, we're going to remove it. 
every single fake Jesus frequency that entered your home and your life and your family, we want you to cut it out. And this morning, you don't have to pray for God to give you what is rightfully yours. You don't have to fast for it. You don't have to beg for it. You have to get as close as you can to God, the real Jesus. You have to want nothing. You have to ask nothing. You just go before him and be his child. He does the rest. Every time I was blessed by anything, it was never because of prayer. It is because I am his son. And he will never let his son go without. I know who I am because his spirit lives in me. I want you to find the same relationship with your God. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the son of the living God. His desire is for you not to chase things, money and friends and everything else physical. He wants you to chase let your flesh die. And if it's dead, it needs nothing. I'm closing with this last statement. If, the, if you want nothing, the devil can't tempt you anymore. And if he can't tempt you anymore, your hands or your life is safe. So I want to pray with you. First, to rededicate your life to Jesus. And then, first to cut ties with all frequencies of darkness. Every relationship with any fake Jesus. Make sure that somebody that's leading your soul, they are pure. They are genuine. Make sure that they don't have these symptoms we spoke about. Make promoting this Lutheran created article written by Paul who was a woman hater, uh, um, subjugator, even told men, don't marry. But if you can't contain yourself, then marry. But rather stay single. Uh, uh, the people that were shaped and cultured and fashioned by Jewish culture and Roman influence, they were trying to be in favor with Roman people to say that they must, they, they, the slaves must obey their masters. All these things are wrapped up in this book and many of us pick it up to say this is the word of God, equal to God. So be careful. When you hear someone saying that, fake Jesus. And beloved, there are many. So let's pray that we cut off. Break. If you want to break that tie, raise your hands where you are. Pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, if anybody believes in fake Jesus and tries to influence me, I cut off those ties right now. Let my soul be wide awake to know the real from the fake. Father, I ask for your guidance from this moment on so that if I fall victim, I, I don't want, I, I want to hold you accountable because you must enlighten me. This is your soul that you bought. So, Father, I submit my soul to you. Cut all ties with darkness and I realign with you. Everyone that wants to give their life to Jesus afresh, raise your hand. Father, I submit all these hands in all these homes, all these souls before your throne. As their names have already been written, I pray that a protection over these names be guaranteed. Father, give them salvation benefits. Let the Holy Spirit come upon them and embrace them in Jesus' name. And all God's children all around said, Amen. Beloved, thank you for joining me this morning. I pray that you have a beautiful week ahead. God richly bless you.